right, here we go. Today we have presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr., son of Attorney General Bobby Kennedy, nephew of President John F. Kennedy. Welcome to Vlad TV. Vlad, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Well, you have a a very long history that actually starts before you were born. So I want to get into all that before we begin and tell your story. So you're a part of the legendary Kennedy family. Uh, and your grandfather is Joseph Kennedy. Yes. And uh, he had some pretty famous kids. He had uh, John F. Kennedy, who was the 35th president of the United States, a uh, longtime Senator Ted Kennedy, and Attorney General and Senator Robert F. Kennedy, a.k.a. Bobby Kennedy, who is your father. So do you have any uh, memory of your grandfather growing up? Yeah. I, uh, um, you know, all of us were very close. To my, the, the family was very close-knit. So my grandfather had nine kids. He had how two of the kids died during World War II, one immediately after. Um, Joe, my uncle Joe, was killed on a, he did a, he volunteered for what essentially was a suicide mission. He had completed all of his, um, he, he was on his way home. He had been a pilot uh, out of England, uh, flying over Germany and over the channel. And he had volunteered for a, a mission to fly the first remote-controlled airplane, which they had turned into a flying bomb, and they were going to act. That they, he he had to take it off, and then they were going to um, they were going to send it into the submarine pens off of uh, off of Scandinavia to the Nazi submarine pens, and uh, he had to turn. His job was to turn to take it off, get it at altitude, and a, um, a, another plane that was flying next to him, the, the companion plane, would turn on the remote control and take over the controls of the plane, and he was supposed to uh, parachute out. Mm. As soon as they turned it on, it sparked the bombs in it, and it, and his, it, it disintegrated the plane immediately, and oh, wow. he was not found. He died during the war, and my aunt kicked died immediately after the war in an airplane crash. The seven kids that were left um, were all around Hyannisport. So my, my grandfather bought a house in Hyannisport in 1928. He had been the head of the Securities and Exchange Commission. He had been one of 10 millionaires in this country during the Great Depression. He was a banker. Uh, he owned a movie studio in, in uh, one of the biggest movie studios in, uh, in Hollywood. Or he was the CEO of it and the biggest owner. And then he, um, and he had, as I said, nine kids. Um, he raised them. They all had houses around his house. So that was what is called the Kennedy Compound. My father bought the first of those houses. My father was, uh, was one of the younger kids. I was the first to get married. He had 11 kids. So I have, I have 10 siblings, two of whom have died. Um, and uh, I grew up with my grandfather. My grandfather took us horseback riding every day. Uh, I went out on, he had a boat um, called the Marlin. It's a cabin cruiser. And we went, we went on one, we, we went on some boats every day. So a lot of the family had boats. And, um, but a lot of us went with my grandfather every day. And, uh, and so I, you know, I, we had dinner with him at least one night a week with him and my grandmother, Rose Kennedy. Incidentally, his father was a, um, was a political operative. He was a ward boss for the Democratic Party in Boston. And my grand, my other great grandfather, Rose Kennedy's father was Honey Fitz, who was the first Irish Catholic mayor of Boston. Okay. And like you mentioned, your grandfather was extremely wealthy. You know, the first president yes. of the SEC. Uh, he also owned the, this huge building. It was like the biggest building in America. Yeah, he at owned one point. the biggest building other than the Pentagon, which exactly. is the Merchandise Mart in, in Chicago. Now, I just want to address this rumor because from what I understand, it's not true, but there was always the rumor that he was involved in liquor bootlegging. In liquor bootleg. Yeah, he was not. Right. From what I understand, from what I read, that he actually did start to import, export liquor after it became legal. So he wasn't actually doing it when it was illegal during the whole kind of the, the criminal yeah, part he of it. Bought, when they, you know, the way that prohibition ended, 
Prohibition was very unpopular among the Irish, particularly. Right. And in urban populations, it was really, it was a rural impulse. And, not, you know, in the urban populations, uh, it was extremely unpopular. So, um, uh, but my grandfather, you know, but, and by the way, my grandfather would, went through three presidential appointments, including the head of the SEC, and, about, um, and uh, he had a high job up in the shipbuilding for the United States Navy, and he, had, um, and he was the ambassador to uh, the Court of St. James to England. He had to go through Senate hearings in each one. If he had had anything to do with the liquor industry or with prohibition, he had so many political enemies, and that would have come out. Yeah. Um, he, uh, but during, the way that prohibition ended is you had to have, I think you had 20, uh, 26 states had to, uh, uh, had to disavow prohibition in order, uh, in order for the, the, uh, to alter the Constitution. Yeah. So when it got close to those 23 or 26, they knew it was coming. So he went over to Scotland and he bought pinch vodka or pinch whiskey, which was one of the premier whiskey companies. Mm -hmm. He did it with James Roosevelt, who was the president's son. Okay. The two of them bought it, and then they they imported to Canada. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much, but a lot of the stuff. So it was at warehouses right next to the U.S. border. So the second that prohibition ended, all okay. the liquor came. Now, he was never accused of being a bootlegger mm -hmm. until after he had his stroke and couldn't defend himself, and my uncle was killed. Uh -huh. It was 1964, and there was a... Um, and the the at that point the CIA was uh, was uh, trying to uh, uh, let's say disparage the rumors that they may have had something to do with President Kennedy's assassination. There was a big effort that was run by a, a, an individual in the CIA who had been the New York Times bureau chief in Havana. And his job for the next 30 years was blackening the Kennedy name. And that is one of the rumors that he started at that time. And it was in order to promote this story that my, my uncle had been killed by the mafia because he had double-crossed them because the Giancana mob had helped him win Chicago. And then my father had prosecuted Sam Giancana and put 600 people in jail from that mob and from, you know, the Traficante and Carlos Marcello organizations and that this was their revenge. So this is a nonsense story that makes no sense. In fact, when I was a little kid, when in 1959, I went to, and there's pictures of me, sitting in the Senate hearing room on my mother's lap in the front row, my father um, eviscerated Sam Giancana. So Sam Giancana, I think, took the fifth um, 50 times in front of my father. My father ridiculed him. My father asked him, "Are you, you know, do you hang people from who, who, who cross you from meat hooks? Have you done that? He giggled, and um, my father said, you're giggling like a little girl, aren't you? Like a little girl. So Sam Giancana did not like my father. Now, what people are saying is, six months after that hearing, somehow my father was my uncle's, was Jack Kennedy's campaign manager. Somehow my father then cuts a deal with Sam Giancana, who he ridiculed, who he's putting in jail, who he's attacked for years, and they make up, and Sam Giancana gives my uncle the White House it doesn't make any sense. Right. Not only that, but my, you know, the people accuse my, they, you know, one of the kind of another rumor that was circulating at the time was that my uncle won the presidency by uh, conniving with Mayor Daley to fix the, California, the Chicago vote. Well, Mayor Daley fixed the Chicago vote for the lower ballot candidates all the time. So nobody disagrees with that. The problem with this is that after that vote, first of all, after the vote, Mayor Daley was so outraged about that these accusations that my uncle had won uh, unfairly that he offered to do a recount and pay for it himself. 
He also, even if my uncle had lost Illinois, he would have still won the presidency. So um, it is what it is. It is what it is. Right, because the rumor was always, and even when I interview mafia guys like Michael Franzese, it was like, okay, so the, the grandfather was the bootlegger who worked with the mafia, and then the mafia helped John F. Kennedy become president, and then when Bobby went after the mafia, they felt betrayed, so they... You know, kill John F. Kennedy and and so forth. Yeah, and uh, you've uh, heard this a million times. I've heard it a million times. Everybody who's and there's a lot of writers out there who would have liked to find some evidence. There's a guy called David Horowitz who spent years looking for that evidence and finally said, "Yeah, there is not there. It didn't happen. You know, my uncle had nothing to do with my my uncle at that. You know, right out of high school, he became the youngest bank president in the country. He wasn't bootlegging. He was. He had a very visible life with with eyeballs on him all. I mean, my, my grandfather all the time. And then he went right into politics. So you know, if he had been, been, he had a lot of enemies on Wall Street, all over the country. If he had been a bootlegger at any point in his life, that would have been found out at the time and would have been used against him a million times. And it just there's no place in his life. His life is very well known, yeah. and there's no place in his life that that could have happened. Okay, so like you mentioned, you were the third of eleven kids to Robert F. Kennedy. So you're growing up in this, you know, very privileged, you know, uh, wealthy family. And when you were six years old, your uncle John F. Kennedy becomes the thirty-fifth president. Hi, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. You solemnly swear that you will faithfully execute the office of president of the United States. And I will faithfully execute the office of president of the United States. And will, to the best of your ability. And will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. I mean, you're pretty young, but do you remember the elation of your family that someone in your family suddenly well, president remember, of the United I States? I remember everything about the campaign. Mm. You know, I came out here for the convention. It was the first time I've stayed up all night. You know, there's pictures of me at the convention here in Los Angeles. I, I, my, they, my dad took us to Northern California for two days, and I caught a snake up there, and I kept that snake in my pocket. So I had him at the convention, and we had one of the boxes, and I was playing with him, and there's a lot of pictures of me doing that. But, I, you know, I remember we were staying at the Hearst's, house at, you know, William Randolph Hearst's uh, house when we were out here, and I remember that. I remember the fountain outside, and I remember when my uh, when my uncle got, you know, I was in the hall when my uncle was, nom was, uh, was nominated as the candidate, and I watched his speech, and, you know, uh, my, me and my siblings were running around the hall uh, collecting buttons and that kind of stuff. But, you know, we had been involved in the campaign, too. We were very, very much aware. My parents were always very good about including us in everything and telling us what they were doing and telling us about the importance in history. And, you know, so that was just part of the milieu growing up. Okay, so John F. Kennedy becomes president, and... As soon as he becomes president, he appoints his younger brother, Bobby, as U.S. Attorney General, your dad. Yes. So as soon as your dad becomes Attorney General, he starts this war against organized crime. Yeah. Well, he had already started the war. Before that. Yeah. yeah because my uncle had been on the Rackets Committee hmm. in the United States Senate. He had been in the Senate before he came to, before he became president. And my father was chief counsel of the Rackets Committee. Mm. So my father had, you know, the, his big issue. And it was unusual for Democrats at that time. It was like a daring move for Democrats. Because organized crime had infiltrated organized labor. Right. And particularly the Teamsters Union, but some of the other unions. And if you were a Democrat and you had ambitions to run for president, you needed the unions. So, you know, people would warn my father and my uncle, don't go after the unions because you're gonna, you, you need them to win. Yeah. And they did it anyway. But my father really felt that it was the, he, at that time, he felt like it was the gravest threat to American democracy because the mafia had infiltrated all of these institutions that were part of key to our democracy, including the labor unions, but also the judiciary. They controlled a lot of judges. They, uh, they owned a lot of Congress people. And he felt like it was a, a threat to democracy and ultimately the republic. 
Well, yeah. I mean, at the time, the FBI director, J. Edgar Hoover, he said the mafia doesn't exist. Yeah. Hmm. And that was based on the rumor that he was gay and they had pictures of him cross-dressing. So there was a little bit of a leverage situation. He also had, you know, Hoover had also relationships with some of the mobsters and particularly Mickey Cohen, who was the chief mobster here in Los Angeles. And Hoover and his his partner um, would come out by partner, I mean his, uh, you know, romantic partner, Clive Tolson, would come out here to bet on the horse races. And they were we were given, you know, vouchers by, by Cohen. So, and this is pretty well documented. Um, and so, that, you know, there were other reasons that he may want, not wanted to have exposed the mafia, but there were individual police um, uh, captains and commanders in the city police, including here in Los Angeles, who knew the mafia existed, who were, uh, who were, had active organized crime units in New York City and New Orleans and in California. And they were all doing, they were the only people in the country who were investigating organized crime. My father became close to those guys. Okay. So your dad is going after the mafia and he actually called it, his quote was, Basically, there's a private government of organized crime with an annual income of billions resting on a base of human suffering and moral corrosion. And during his time, organized crime figures, convictions rose by 800%. So he was putting a lot of people in prison. And he went after Hoffa. He had something called the Get Hoffa Squad. And him and Hoffa were almost like mortal enemies. Hoffa even said there was a blood feud (laughs) between him and your dad. Yeah. And Hoffa eventually ended up going to prison. And And Hoffa hired people to kill my father. Really? Yeah, he hired a guy to shoot him in the swimming pool because my father swam every morning. And he hired and and to firebomb our house uh, to kill our whole family. And when I was a kid, our house was in a remote part of, at that time, a very remote part of Virginia, which was uh, McLean. It was before they built the highway, but Dolly Madison Highway. So it was a place where a truck trucks would never come out there, a diesel truck, 18-wheeler. But when we were, well, our, our house was a, a very large property, uh, like six acres, but it was surrounded by roads and almost a square of roads. And those roads, all day long, there would be... Um, there would be trucks going around our place, blowing their horns uh, from the Teamsters Union. My, the Teamsters Union offices were right next to the Justice Department. My father famously left the Justice Department at 10 o'clock one night and was driving past the Teamsters Union office. And he looked up at hot. There was still lights on in Hoffa's office. So he went back to the office and worked. He went back to work because <laughs> he didn't want to be outworked by Hoffa. So he did have a personal blood feud with him, I would say. And, uh, you know, they did arrest this. One of the guys came forward who was part of this murder um, plot to kill my father and confessed everything. Wow. Well, gladly nothing happened at, at that point. Okay. And then November 22nd, 1963, your uncle John F. Kennedy gets assassinated. Yeah. When you first found out, how'd you react? I was picked up at Sidwell Sid well, Friends School, and we saw the um, the flags were... Uh, being lowered to half mass. My mother picked us up and she said, a bad man kill has shot um, Uncle Jack. And I went home, you know, I was, got home probably 15 minutes later. My father was walking in the yard with um, John McComb, who was the head of the CIA. The CIA was only... uh, maybe three quarters of a mile from my house, probably the last half a mile from my house. So my, we used to ride horses every day through the CIA campus. It was when the, the, you know, the building was first being constructed. And then afterward, my father would spend time there every day because of the Cuba issue. And he and McComb was one of the first people to arrive at the house. And my father asked McComb during that conversation, did the CIA do this to my brother? Mm. And McComb, who wouldn't have known anyway, you know, my father and uncle had fired Alan Dulles after the Bay of Pigs. 
and they brought in McComb, who was a straight arrow. He was a Republican Catholic businessman. And they wanted to straight out the agency. But of course, he never, he really didn't know what was happening at the agency. And Dulles was still running a lot of things. Um, so he, my father asked him, my father actually made three calls, two calls that day in addition to asking McComb. He called a friend of his who was one of the leaders of the Cuban Brigade, a guy called, which had, you know, it was the Bay of Pigs Brigade, yeah. called Harry Ruiz, who was a perennial figure around my house. He was in a hotel in Washington, and he asked him, did your people do this? Did the Cubans do this? The CIA Cubans? And then he called the uh, desk officer at the CIA and asked them the same thing. So that was my father's initial impulse. And when I got home, I went down with my brother, uh, Joe, and me. We all got home at once, and David, and we went down and, you know, hugged my father, and we stood at the bottom of the hill, at Hickory Hill, where we, you know, our house was at the top of a long grassy hill, and there was a tree at the bottom of it, and we all just stood there for a long time. My father was just totally shattered. Yeah. Well, Lee Harvey Oswald was arrested for the murder, but before he can go to trial, he got killed by Jack Ruby. Yeah. I mean, and this has been a, a conspiracy, you know, for decades at this point. Based on what you know, as being part of the Kennedy family. Was it just Lee Harvey Oswald? Was it multiple people? What do you think actually happened? Well, first of all, you know, when I was standing in the White House, in the East Room of the White House, next to my uncle's casket, when President Johnson came in and told my mother and my Aunt Jackie and my dad, who were all standing next to me, that a man named Jack Ruby had killed Lee Harvey Oswald. And I said to my mom at that time, I said, why did he do that? Did he love our family? Because it made no sense to me. Why would you kill somebody? And, you know, it didn't make any sense to anybody. Why would you go in broad daylight to the police station and risk your life? You know, um, and he later said that he, uh, he did it to spare Jackie uh, the, the anguish of a long trial. Well, he had never said anything nice about Jack and his wife. He worked for the mafia. He, he ran a, a strip club that, that had what they called B-girls, which were uh, girls that would change, you know, every two weeks or months and a new group would be brought in. And those girls went, were, went to these B-clubs all over the country, all over the Southwest. And they were part of a, you know, stable um, that was part of Carlos Marcello's organization. Carlos Marcello was the New Orleans mob boss who also, Dallas was in his district. And he was deeply involved in Cuba. You know, all, him, Santa Straficante, Sam Giancana, and Carlos Marcello all had a, casinos in Havana that Castro had shut down. So they were all tied in with the CIA's efforts to, to kill Castro. And that's how they all got involved. Now, you ask me what I think happened. I mean, I, you know, the, the Warren Commission said that Lee Harvey Oswald was a lone shooter mm -hmm. and nothing about Lee Harvey Oswald's life or the evidence. That there was so much evidence, even at that time, when, we, when it was just a, a tip of the iceberg, that that could not have possibly been true. But then in 1979... Congress spent uh, a year and a half, a congressional committee, the House Select Assassinations Committee, in fact, two congressional committees, um, spent a year and a half investigating, and they had a lot more documents and a lot more witnesses than the Warren Commission had, and they came to the conclusion that my uncle was killed by a conspiracy. The lead investigator was a guy called Bob, Bob Blakey, and Bob Blakely is now a professor, law professor, he believed that um, it was more likely the mafia, this is before they knew that the mafia and the CIA had merged. Mm. Um, but he believed that, the, that it was more likely the mafia. Almost everybody on his staff and the, the, the senator who actually started the investigation, uh, a, a, a senator called Schweitzer, all believed that the CIA was the... Um, was the uh, uh, principal culprit. 
And but the the conclusion, the official conclusion in the congressional record was that John F. Kennedy was killed by a conspiracy. Blakey has since changed his opinion, and Blakey now believes that the CIA was involved because so much other. Um, but they, I would say there is so much evidence that it is they, that of CIA involvement, not only with my uncle's murder, but then with the you know the sixty-year cover-up. We know there's including probably twenty confessions of people who were involved. A lot of them were deathbed confessions, but you know key figures like David Morales, like David, David Atley Phillips, um, like E. Howard Hunt, people who were involved in the planning, the execution, people who were present. You know, Woody Harrelson's dad was involved in the in the assassination, and uh, and he confessed multiple Woody times. Woody Harrelson's dad was involved in the assassination of John F. Kennedy. He was not a shooter. He what he said his role was was bringing when the shooting started on the grassy from the grassy knoll. Um, a, a gr- big crowd of people saw the smoke coming up, and they ran up to look at it. To see what you know, what was the source of it, and Secret Service men suddenly appeared on the hill and pushed them all down and said, "You can't come up here." The Secret Service later said they there were no Secret Service people on that hill. Woody Harrelson, Charles Harrelson's function was to deliver the Secret Service badges to a group of people on the hill. What he says and what a lot of people say who were there that day. Um, is that they knew they did not know it was going to be assassination, that they knew there was going to be an incident, but they never imagined it would be a murder. And a lot of those people then realized that they were part of this, you know, uh, conspiracy in the death of the president. And they kind of scattered. A lot of them were subsequently murdered themselves, including the key members, Johnny Roselli, who the day that he was um, he was the he was the liaison between the CIA and the mafia, the three mafia chiefs. The day that he was subpoenaed by the House Assassination Committee, he disappeared. Was found a week later, chopped into small pieces in a oil drum in Biscayne Bay in Miami. Uh, and Sam Giancana, when he was uh, subpoenaed by to testify the mob boss, the Chicago outfit boss. He was subpoenaed to testify for that committee, and he was murdered in his basement by an assassin. So there was was over 30 people who were killed, who were, you know, who were witnesses or potential witnesses. And then a lot of people have confessed. Woody's dad, you know, was a a very, very charismatic guy, and I'm very close to Woody, and we've talked about this. He actually confessed for the first time while he was in a, a police shootout. So he was he was a he was a professional hitman. Um, he had worked for uh, the CIA. He had been recruited out of the military, worked for the CIA, and then worked for the Carlos Marcella mob. And he died in maximum obscurity prison um, for uh, the murder of a federal judge. But. Uh, you know, he was a very, very interesting character, and he confessed at one time, but then he told Woody the story, which Woody told me. And and also, there's photographs of him at the site that day. Wow. Um, they, if, you, if you go on Google and put up three, say, three tramps, three tramps, uh, JFK assassination, Dallas, his picture will come up. Okay. Yep, I'm looking at it right now. Yeah. I mean, so if it wasn't Lee Harvey Oswald working by himself, what do you think was the motive behind your uncle getting killed? It was people who were, um, it was a, a, a group from the CIA um, who were, uh, who had been involved in uh, Miami, um, who were angry at my uncle, felt my uncle committed treason, first of all, in the Bay of Pigs by not sending a co- air cover. And then after the Cuban Missile Crisis, my uncle had established this very close relationship with with uh, Khrushchev. Mm. And Khrushchev, who, who was the head of Russia at the time, who was the head of Russia, and Khrushchev and he, they knew they couldn't trust the people around them and the intelligence apparatus and the military. They, they were both in the same position. They were both war heroes who'd seen the bloodiest part of war. Khrushchev had been basically was going to be purged by Stalin, and he had he had been in Stalingrad. Mm. 
which was the worst war. That was the worst battle in World War II. I mean, the worst. Yeah. So, and he had been in the middle of it. He did not ever want to go to war again. He didn't want it. But he was surrounded by people, as was Jack, who believed that war was not only inevitable, but it was, uh, it was, the, it was the sooner the better. And so they figured out halfway through, you know, two years in, they figured out they had to start talking to each other individually. My uncle installed a hot phone at the White House, another one at the Cape, which was red. We knew if we touched that, that Khrushchev would answer. <laughs> but we were told not to touch that one. Um, and and there, there's still my, uh, my brother owns that house right now. And the wires to that phone are still sticking out of the wall. <laughs> um, but... Uh, uh, but Jack also started exchanging these letters with him, which were smuggled to him by a Soviet spy called Georgi Bolshakoy, who was at our house all the time. We loved him. We knew he was a KGB spy and GRU spy, but he could do he could do rope climbing with his. He was a he was a he was like a, a fire high. He was built like a fire engine, but very powerful. He used to do push-up contests with my father. He'd do rope climbing contests. He knew how to do the Cossack dancing. And so we loved him. But he began smuggling these letters from Khrushchev trusted him, my uncle, my dad trusted him. And he began to smuggle these letters. The first one he smuggled in was folded in the New York Times. And they, um, and, uh, and they exchanged these very, very extraordinary personal letters talking about how they needed to stay out of war. And so um, Khrushchev then, after the Bay of Bay, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, Khrushchev had called Castro to come and spend time with him. And Castro had spent several months with Khrushchev in Russia, and Khrushchev had urged him to make peace with my uncle. Castro had reached out to my uncle um, immediately after that. The day that my uncle died, Castro was meeting with his emissary at Veradero Beach in, um, in Cuba, talking about the format for a, to end the embargoes, which my uncle made it clear to him, you, I don't care what kind of government you have, it can be Marxist, communist, that's not our business. We don't want Soviet, we, we, we don't want you to be a Soviet base. Mm -hmm. So, so anything, so, all, all Soviet military, out and we want you to stop Che Guevara from going in and making problems with the Alliance for Progress countries in Latin America. And that's all he wanted. Yeah. And Castro agreed to that. That afternoon, he received a call. I picked up the call while my, my uncle's um, emissary was sitting there. And, uh, and um, he, he said to him, it's over. Um, President Kennedy's been shot. So, oh, you know, they didn't, they knew, they, they, uh, my uncle did it behind the backs of the State Department, but they knew, the CIA knew what was happening. And my uncle, th 30 days before his death, on October 22nd, 1963, he signed Executive Order 263, ordering all U.S. troops home from Vietnam. So he ended the Vietnam War with the first thousand coming home in December. There was only 16,000 troops and their advisors. They weren't allowed to participate in combat. He found out they had been and 75 had died. And he said that that morning, he said, no more, we're done. And um, he ordered them all home. And 30 days after that, he was killed. So, and the, Vietnam was a CIA project, you know, from beginning to end. So there were people in the agency and we know who they were. You know, it was David Adley Phillips, it was Bill Harvey, it was E. Howard Hunt, it was Alan Dulles, it was um, James Jesus Angleton. We know the shooters. They were, you know, three men from, uh, who, were, who had been in Batista's battalions in Cuba hmm. and who later, you know, died under different circumstances. One of them died in a prison in Cuba, um, by, you know, in prison by Castro. But... Uh, you know, you ask me what I think, I, what, I, what I would say is I'm an attorney. I've tried hundreds of cases. I was a district attorney. Um, if I had to, uh, if, I had a, if I had to prove my case that the CIA murdered my uncle, um, I'm very confident just on the evidence that is out there now that that would be very, very easy to prove mm. um, in front of any jury in America. Now. 
people shouldn't trust me on this. I'm not, I'm not trying to convince anybody. People need to do their own research about everything. You live in a democracy, make up your own mind. But, you know, one thing my father told me, people in authority lie. And, you know, part of the duty of living in a democracy is to maintain a posture of constant skepticism toward any aggregation of power. And, you know, that's sorry, you, trusting the experts is not something you do in a democracy. That's not a feature of democracy or science. It's a feature of religion and totalitarianism. You know, it's not a thing. Mm -hmm. The thing that we were all trying to, to, to hold it to, you need to do your own research. And for people who are curious about this, the best book that you can read is a book by Jim Douglas called The Unspeakable. And he has, in a, in a riveting way, with poetic writing, uh, distilled millions of pages of documents and all of these confessions and all of the evidence and put it in one really beautifully written story in this book. And if you pick it up, you, uh, you won't be able to put it down, but it's a, very, it's a brilliant book. And it must have, it probably has a thousand footnotes in it. Okay, so let's fast forward to 1968. You're 14 years old at the time and you're in boarding school at the Georgetown Preparatory School in Maryland. Your father, Bobby Kennedy, is running for the presidential nomination with the Democrats. And during this process on June 5th, 1968, he was at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. As he was leaving the ballroom, he decided to go through the kitchen. And I guess his bodyguard, FBI agent Bill Barry, told him to avoid the kitchen because it was very crowded. As he was going through, shaking hands with everyone, a 24-year-old Palestinian man named Saran Saran shot him with a 22 caliber revolver. He was hit three times. Five other people were wounded as well. When you found out that your dad had gotten killed, what went through your mind? Well, I didn't, first of all, I, I would dispute that description of what happened. Okay. Um, I don't believe that Sir Hans bullets ever hit my father. Okay. And neither did the uh, coroner. Um, who uh, uh, Thomas Noguchi, who is probably the most famous coroner in American history, who did an autopsy that is known as the perfect autopsy. He actually flew in the, the chief coroners of all the branch, every branch of the military service to sit in the surgery theater to watch what he did because he knew what had happened in Dallas. And he didn't want to repeat. And he, he, what he found, Sir Han had fired... Surhan had eight shots. He had a 22 revolver, or eight shots in it. And he fired two shots at my father. One of those shots uh, hit, the first shot hit um, Paul Schrade, who was the UAW, the United Auto Workers uh, Deputy Chief, who had, that was there. There was only two unions that supported my father. Uh, the United Auto Workers and Cesar Chavez Union. And Paul Schrade had recruited Cesar Chavez to the United Farm Workers. So he was very close to my dad. He got shot in the head and he was okay. And, you know, he actually died a year and a half ago and spent the last 20 years of his life trying to get Sir Ann out of, out of prison, the man who shot him. Hmm. Um, the other shot went past my father's head and hit a door jam behind him, where, and it was later removed by the LAPD. It was dug out of the door jam. The whole door jam was removed. He was then pounced upon by six men, including Raver Johnson, who was the 1960 decathlon champion, gold medal Olympian, one of my father's closest friends, mm -hmm. and uh, Rosie Greer, who was one of the you know uh, fearsome foursome uh, who had been a bodyguard for my dad? He was you know one of the most famous football players of his time, and uh, and four other people, including the uh, the the guy who was uh, uh, the director or the concierge of the of the ambassador hotel, and they pounced on him. They took his hand and pointed away from my father. So they pointed the opposite direction. Raver Johnson later told me that he tried to get the gun out of Sir Han's hand, but Sir Han had superhuman strength. He's a little tiny man. When I, you know, I've met him. Spent, five foot five, I think. Yeah, he's tiny. 
but he, he couldn't, this big, you know, Rafer is like six foot four and solid muscle. He could not get the, and you had, you know, you had a, you had a professional lineman from, the, you know, the Oakland Raiders there that day. And they couldn't get it. So he fires six more shots in the opposite direction and it empties the chamber of his gun. He's always in front of my father, by the way. My father, he's, he, he's sitting on, with his back to a steam table, and they bent him over the steam table, and, and he fired the, the bullets this way. As you pointed out, those bullets each hit people. So five people, one of them got hit twice. Hmm. So if you just do the math, my father got shot four times from behind. You know, and he only he hit eight bullets in his gun. He didn't reload. We know what happened to the first two, and we know what happened to the second six. We know what happened to every one of those bullets. My father was killed from behind. He was shot four times. That One of the shots went harmlessly through the shoulder pad of his suit. The other three were, you know, were, uh, were fatal or potentially fatal. And one of them was right behind his ear. All of them were contact shots. Um, that's what Thomas Noguchi found, meaning the barrel of the gun was either touching his skin or his clothing and was uh, and, and left a carbon tattoo or was close enough within an inch, close enough to leave a carbon tattoo. And, um, and the, the gun was being held at an upward angle. So he was shot from behind by somebody who was standing behind him with the gun pressed between the two of them and firing. And that man was almost certainly Eugene Thane Cesar, who was a security guard who had been hired the day before. So they already knew when he got the job, he already knew my father was gonna be at that hotel. His full-time job was at the Lockheed plant. And, and before that he had worked at another defense plant, um, which was Howard Hughes's company. And uh, and those and he had a top security classifications at that plant. Um, Lisa Pease, who's a researcher, has uh, has uh, has found documents where he self identifies as a CIA uh, uh, agent. Um, he he ended up leaving the country. He was very outspoken against my father. He believed that my father uh, would start a race war and my father would put blacks in charge of the country. And, uh, and he hated blacks. And he ended up leaving the country. He died about a year and a half ago in the Philippines. Before he died, I tried to go over there and interview him. Um, he originally said that it would cost me $10,000, but he would do it. And then when I got close to, to going, he said, it's going to be fifteen. Hmm. And then a day before I left, he said, it's going to be 25000 So then I, I thought, he's playing a game. Yeah. And I ended up not going. Um, but, uh, you know, I can't prove that my father was killed um, by the CIA. Um, but there's a lot of circumstantial evidence. And then, you know, there's a lot of other circumstantial evidence. And particularly with Sir Han's background uh, and his trial, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there, and, and the cover-up. There was a lot of agency involvement. Saran Saran did an interview in 1980. He said that it was a combination of liquor and anger over the anniversary of the 1967 Arab-Israeli war that triggered what he did. He said, that night I went to observe the Jewish Zionist parade in celebration of the June 5th, 1967 victory over the Arabs. That was the catalyst that triggered me on that night. In addition, there was a consumption of liquor, and I want the public to understand that. So he felt that it was the Arab-Israeli conflict and a whole lot of liquor that kind of caused that. But you actually flew down and talked to him in prison at one point, right? Yeah. And what did he tell you? He said about that night, he said the same thing that he's consistently said for, you know, what, 50 years, that he has no memory of what happened that night. Hmm. He's still alive today. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what he told you. He just said, I don't remember. He didn't remember what happened that night. He does not believe at this point that he did it. Okay. And, and you know, what he's always said is, they told me they did it, that I did it. 
I don't have any memory of doing it, yeah. but, um, you know, I assume that I did it. And he also, you know, he, uh, he's a very kind of sweet old man. He cried when he talked about the impact of, of it on, you know, he knows he was involved in it. Mm-hmm. So there's no doubt about that. Um, but he cried when he talked about my mom and, you know, about seeing all of us when we were growing up without a dad. Well, yeah, I mean, you lost your uncle a few years before then, but now this is your dad. Yeah. How badly did this affect you? Um, I mean, you know, what is the comparison? You know, the people lose their parents all the time. Yeah, but not under circumstances like this normally. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to argue that it didn't have an impact on me. Clearly, it had an impact on me and on my life, and it had an impact on the whole country, a dramatic impact, I would say, on the country. Um, and the direction that we took after his death, with Nixon getting elected, and what happened that summer with the riots in Chicago, um, in terms of you know the impact on me, well, there's lots of people who lose their parents. I feel like I had an advantage over most people because you know my father left a really clear moral milestones for me, and he was uh, he was a heroic figure, so it gave me something to live up to. It wasn't, you know, I think it would be much more difficult if I was, you know, a black kid in Watts whose father got, you know, shot in a gang shootout or something like that, and then, you know, what's, where's your role model? So, and then I had a big family that came together I had deep religious faith that, you know, is, uh, helps, helps you through, you know, any kind of, helps you process any kind of crisis like that or any kind of tragedy. And then I had, you know, I, I had, uh, we just had mechanisms for doing it. I mean, we, you know, we had been through tragedy before and we had, uh, I think, a very, very loving family. My mom at one point, Said, I was asking her when one of my brothers was killed. I asked her, I said, do you think that hole that you leave, you know, that they leave inside of you when, when they die, do you think that ever gets better, that it ever gets any smaller? And she said, it doesn't get any smaller. Uh, what your job is, is to grow yourself bigger around the hole. You have to take the best parts of that person's character and integrate it into your own life through discipline, through restraint. And in doing that, we make ourselves bigger and the whole gets proportionally smaller. And so, you know, I was living in a milieu where those kind of lessons were part of our daily lives. And I think they gave me an advantage in processing that tragedy that, you know, other people in less enriched environments probably wouldn't have. Well. After that situation, you were expelled from two different boarding schools for using drugs. Did the drug use start after your dad died? One of them was for a lady friend that I had. Okay. <laughs> so it was, and I'm okay. not saying I wasn't doing drugs at the time, but okay. it was, uh, you know, yeah, I started doing drugs after my dad died. Okay, to try to cope with the loss? Oh, I, who knows? I mean, yeah. I feel honestly that I was... That I was born an addict and that, you know, I would have, no matter what happened, I probably would have uh, gone that way. But who knows? You know, you can't, there's no way to reconstruct that. But I feel, feel like a lot of the thing that I had ADHD when I was a kid and that I was, I had a big empty hole inside of myself. And that, you know, I couldn't focus, I couldn't concentrate in the middle. Of, and the minute I started taking drugs, I became calm and I was able to focus. And I actually started doing really well in school. Oh, I think I was medicating various issues that I had. And, um, you know, and if the medication still worked, I'd still be doing it. But, you know, after, you know, you do it for a while, um, you know, particularly I was using heroin. Um, it turns on you and, you know, it works for a while. It does, it solves all your problems for a little while. Right. And then, you know, it's like dancing with a gorilla. You figure out that you're not stopping <laughs> the until the gorilla gets tired of it. <laughs> I've never heard that before. That's a, that's a good comparison. 
Then next year, your grandfather dies. Yeah, my grandfather had a stroke in 62. Uh, oh, okay, so... So he was disabled after that and, uh-huh. and, and really never talked again. He never had a normal conversation. He could only grunt. Okay, so it took, you know, you had already prepared yourself for that over the course of seven years. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, after getting kicked out of a couple of schools, you end up getting into Harvard. Yeah. Most people who get expelled from schools don't get into Harvard. Can you explain how you uh, accomplished that? I was a top student in my class for the last uh, two years of of school. And, um, you know, I had a good academic record. That's one reason I'm sure that, you know, Harvard looked at the fact that my dad had been a presidential candidate, that, you know, I had generations of Kennedys. My aunt, my grandfather had been to Harvard. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. Um, my father had been to Harvard. My uncle had been to Harvard, and um, and so and you know they they, they favor le- legacies. But yeah. I, you know, so I, I would say there are a lot of factors, and you know, and that was and it was a lot easier to get into Harvard back then than it is right now. Yeah. Okay, so you go to Harvard, you graduate with a bachelor's in American history and literature, then you go to London School of Economics. And then you go to Virginia Law School, where you get your uh, law degree, and then a master's of law from Pace University. So you really take the whole school thing very seriously moving forward. At one point, didn't you have problems uh, passing the bar? Yeah, I, uh, I failed the bar by one point. Okay. I got 659 out of 660, but they didn't say that in the newspaper articles. I just said, idiot, <laughs> flunks bar. <laughs> it's, it's, it's uh, anyway, that's one of the, the downsides of celebrity. Okay. I, I, and by the way, mm-hmm. I was a heroin addict at that point. Well, right, because in 1983, when you were 29 years old, you were charged with heroin possession. Yeah. Was that a turning point? Because now it's out in the public. And yeah, that's Kennedy right. and that, yeah, I mean, one of the things, uh, the, one of the problems I had, Vlad, was, uh, you know, there was, be, because of the, you know, the, uh, the, the strictures that I'd grown up in, uh, that, you know, anytime anything bad, do you tell anything bad, it's going to, you tell anybody any secrets about yourself, it's going to get in the press. So me, the idea of going into a 12-step meeting and start telling, being truthful to people was, I, 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 I just as soon go, you know, swim to the bottom of the ocean and, you know, try to breathe. I, I just right. couldn't do it. So, um, but all of a sudden, everybody knew I was a drug addict. And it gave me the freedom to actually get help. And, you know, I immediately... Uh, uh, I'd say I immediately had a, a spiritual realignment because I was able to go in and be honest for the first time in my life. And it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't just not having to do drugs, but it was not having to lie anymore and to hide things that I could just be, you know, who I was and be honest. Well, right. You got two years probation and community service and you went into a drug treatment center, like you mentioned. Was that the point that you kicked drugs? Yeah. A lot of people try to kick, though, you know, and then they come back, they, you know, they come back to it, situations happen. What do you think was the secret to you actually kicking drugs so long ago and not going back? I, because I, I, you know, I came into the 12-step program and I gave up control. You know, I didn't, you know, they, they say in, you know, 12-step programs, they say half measures avail us nothing, which seems unfair because half measures should avail us half, <laughs> right? Right. But they, if you don't do the, if you don't completely commit to it, it uh, if you commit a hundred percent, it's guaranteed to work. And I committed a hundred percent. I said, you know, whatever I need to do to get sober, I'm going to do. And I was so done with being, I didn't like it. You know, for 14 years, I've been trying to quit. So I started, uh, I started doing, you know, shooting heroin when I was 15 years old. And um, I uh, and I, but I always was trying to quit. 
it was I was always doing it without my own permission. You know, I was always doing it. Uh, um, you know, again, I was. I knew I was living against conscience. I knew that this is not what I wanted to do with my life. And I, the weird thing is, I had iron willpower in every other area of my life. Like I gave up candy for Lent when I was fourteen, and I never ate candy again until I was in college. I gave up desserts about the same time, and I never ate a dessert again until I was a freshman in college. I was playing sports, and I was playing rugby, and I I was trying to bulk up, and I started eating desserts again. But I felt like I could do anything with my willpower. But this compulsion was impervious to will. I would tell myself at nine o'clock in the morning, I'm never going to do that again. And at four o'clock in the afternoon, I'd be doing it. And, you know, I, it was the most, to me, the most demoralizing feature of addiction of the disease was my incapacity to keep contract with myself. I, you know, I, um, I was baffled and completely demoralized by it. So when I finally got the opportunity that to be sober, I just said, I, you know, whatever I need to do to make this work, I'm going to do. And I did. That's what I did. And my my desire for drugs and alcohol was just lifted. And it was like, it was as if I had never been a drug addict. It was, you know, it was a miracle. It was like it was as big a miracle to me as if I'd been suddenly able to walk on water. Congratulations, heroin is one of the worst drugs from everyone I've talked to. And that's the hardest one to kick. So congrats on actually kicking it for that long. Yeah, I mean, I'd rather be addicted to heroin than crack cocaine if you if we want to get into the weeds. Okay, okay. fair enough. <laughs> okay, so you sobered up, you passed the bar, and that's when you started your whole environmental enforcement lawsuit and, you know, what basically carried you on for many decades. Yeah. What really was the motivation to really go after people that were ruining the environment? Well, you know, I always saw, I, first of all, I was always an outdoors person. And that, you know, my father raised us. And we were doing whitewater kayaking on the biggest, you know, rivers in the country from when we were really young. And this was a time when people, you know, normal people were not doing whitewater. It was before it became kind of, you know, something that people do on weekends. It was a commitment and you know, I was fishing from when I was a little kid, and I was training hawks from when I was nine years old and hunting with them. And uh, and so I was like in the woods all the time. And I, this is where I felt the one place I felt calm. And I, when I was a kid, they, you know, the, the Eisenhower's highway program was kicking off, and they built a highway right next to my house. They built it through the pond where I was fish catching frogs and fishing, and you know, they just plowed it over. And I was like, this is like theft. They just, you know, they just ruined this place. They stole it from the public. You know, we, it was, uh, and, and that's how I, you know, I, that's how I viewed environmental injury. I, I, I viewed it as a theft, a theft of the common, a privatization of the commons, of the things that, you know, we're all supposed to share, like air, water, wildlife, fisheries, public lands. The law says, and this ancient law, it goes back to the Code of Justinian. These assets that by their nature are, you know, the assets of the entire community that you can't privatize are not susceptible to private property ownership, air, water, wildlife, fisheries, public lands, aquifers, national forests, all these. They belong to the people. Everybody has a right to use them. Nobody can use them in a way that will diminish or injure their use and enjoyment by others. Under the Code of Justinian, which was the law, the first kind of effort to, to uh, at constitutional government, if you were a citizen of Rome, you whether you were rich or poor, humble or noble, you know, African or, or European, you had an absolute right to cross a beach, throw in a net, and take out your share of the fish. The emperor himself couldn't stop you. And that was just one of the rights of living in a republic. And what you see is that when democracy and a, a republic declines, their powerful entities within society will immediately move to privatize the public trust. And that's what pollution is. It's a way of private, I mean, General Electric, the, the Constitution of the state of New York says that all the fish in the Hudson River belong to the people of New York. Every kid in New York, every you know, black kid in Harlem has an absolute right to, to throw in a plug and pull out a striped bass and bring it home and feed it to their family. 
but they can't do that anymore because General Electric privatized every fish in the river by dumping PCBs into them so they're now too dangerous to eat. So they, you know, they, in order to, to avoid one of the costs of bringing their product to market, they dump their waste into the Hudson and they privatize every fish in the river. And that's what all pollution is. Somebody privatizing the air that my children, you know, I had four kids with asthma on bad air days, um, they got a tax. So their, the air was being privatized, stolen from them. And that's how I always looked at it. I, and I, uh, um, you know, I went to work for commercial fishermen on the Hudson River and recreational fishermen and figured out new ways to start suing polluters. And, you know, we built this organization called Riverkeeper um, into, you know, we helped restore the river. And today the Hudson is an international uh, model for ecosystem protection. It's the richest waterway in the North Atlantic. It produces uh, more pounds of fish per acre, more biomass per gallon than any other waterway in the Atlantic Ocean north of the equator. It's the last river system left in the North Atlantic that still has strong spawning stocks of all of its historical species of migratory fish. And the miraculous resurrection of the Hudson has inspired the creation of river keepers and water keepers all over. We have one here on Santa Monica Bay. We have each one as a patrol boat. We have 350 organizations. Each one is a patrol boat. They each have a full-time paid waterkeeper, and they sue polluters and, uh, and enforce the law because it's illegal to pollute. But the law doesn't get enforced, so that's what we do. And we're now the biggest water protection group in the world. Well, you said that poor communities get most of the burden of mm -hmm. environmental pollution. Yeah. You said polluters always choose the soft target of poverty. And you've also said that uh, Chicago South Side has the highest concentration of toxic waste dumps in America. Uh, uncontrolled toxic waste. That, yeah. You know, that's what the, my first case was representing NAACP um, of, of Austin against the city of Austin, which was trying to put a waste transfer facility in the oldest bad black neighborhood in Austin Valley. And when I started fighting that case, I started looking around and saying, oh, this is what always happens. You know, four out of every five toxic waste dumps in America is in a black neighborhood. The highest concentration of toxic waste dumps um, is in, in, you know, in the country is South Side Chicago. The biggest waste dump in our country is Emile, Alabama, which is 85% black. The most contaminated zip code here in California is East LA. And you go, you know, you can go on and on with that, you know, and probably the biggest, you know, problem in the, in the black community is, uh, you know, our, our chronic disease and, and toxins that are poisoning this generation of kids, you know, including 44% of, of black children in urban areas have dangerous levels of lead in their blood. Um, they're getting mercury toxicity. It lowers IQ and it, it uh, destroys your executive function, your capacity to regulate your own behavior. Um, you know, a lot of these toxins, uh, make kids ADD and ADHD, and they have a lot of other damaging impacts. Well, in 1994, you married Mary Kathleen Richardson. You guys had four kids together. In 2010, you guys got divorced. In 2012, she ended up committing suicide. According to reports, it said that she had found a personal journal of yours where you had written down various encounters, sexual encounters with 37 different women. And that possibly triggered her to take her own life. Would you care to comment on that at all? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, it's hard. First of all. I'm sorry for your loss, by the way. This is yeah. uh, your, your, your mother, um, your kid's mother. Yeah. I mean, I, um, you know, I was not divorced at the time, by the way. I filed for divorce in 2012, but, um, you know, Mary was having a hard time. And I actually, in 2014, when she took her own life, I, I found her and, you know, and I cut her down. She had hanged herself in our- oh, You actually our, found her like that? Yeah. Wow. Um, but, and, you know, it was a heart heartbreaking. And, you know, I had a lot of, um, my children at that time were very vulnerable and they had been through five years of very, very difficult um, times. And the, Mary was an amazing woman. Um, and she was a very, very good mother to them. 
Um, but her, uh, her mental condition began deteriorating. Um, and, uh, you know, in those last years, and they, those kids experienced a lot of that. And, you know, all of those kids, I think, were at risk at that time. They've all turned into amazing, amazing kids. They're all on, uh, they all dwell in school and colleges. They have wonderful friendships. They have wonderful relationships. And they, um, you know, they've excelled in their lives, which is a miracle. And I'm very grateful to um, my wife, Cheryl, who became a mother to them. Um, uh, just so that, you know, I would say this in all cases that um, people uh, uh, who are healthy and have, you know, have um, a strong, uh, who are strong emotionally, no matter what other people do to them or what other people's behaviors, they don't take their own lives. Um, and I'm sure many of the things that I did uh, hurt marry in different ways. But, uh, people take their lives for complex reasons and because of mental illness. Um, so, uh, and, and, you know, one of the, I, in, in the program that I'm in, the, the journal that you're talking about was called, is called Your Fifth Step. Oh, so it was part of the drug treatment yeah, journal? Yeah, it was part okay. of my, uh, it was part of my, uh, you know, my recovery. And yeah, I, I was wondering I, why someone would write this down. <laughs> well, I didn't write, it also was, there weren't like names of people and all of those, they, you know, in the, in the way that the newspapers reported that to make it look like, uh, you know, it was keeping a, you know, kind of a, you know, notches on the trigger. That's right. not what it was. It was uh, my own. Um, you know, way of, of trying to live and examine life and struggling with an issue that I was struggling with at that time. And I kept that fifth step in a safe. And somehow uh, in her, in the place that where she was, she put a lot of effort into getting that safe open and then handing that to her sisters with instruction that if anything happened to her, it should be published in the press. And then shortly after that, she took her own life. Oh, I, you know, it's a tragedy for, you know, I, listen, I take responsibility for my own conduct. Um, and, uh, I, but, you know, it was part of a long history of, of um, you know, of difficulty. Yeah. And for a lot of people. Well, in 1995, you developed a spasmodic dysphonia. Yeah. Which is why your voice sounds the way it does right yeah. now. You had an operation for this at one point, right? I went about, I don't know, about a year ago, I went to, uh, not even a year, I, I'd say seven months ago, I went to Japan, to Kyoto, to get a, 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 a surgery, a procedure that they developed there and that is not available here in the United States. And it basically is my, you know, my brain, it's a neurological injury. So my brain is telling my vocal cords to tighten up. Mm. And they were so tight that they were touching each other and no air could get through. So a lot of times I'd go to speak and nothing would come out. Mm. And I never knew when I went to speak what was going to happen. And um, that, sir, I went over there. The surgery was, you know, they do the surgery on you when you're awake. And what they do is they put a titanium bridge between your vocal cords to keep them separate uh, okay. so that air can pass through. And they do it, you know, when you're awake and you actually try on a whole bunch of different voices. So Cheryl was in the room with me when we did it until the, 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 uh, the blood made her leave the room. <laughs> but she was listening to the voices with me and, and uh, kind of selecting which one they, because uh, some of them, they, your voice actually smooths out when it's a higher pitch, but then, you know, you, you get a high pitch voice. Yeah. Yeah. Then you have a high pitch voice. So it's girl. Side. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, right. you know, I also, it, and I think that really helped me a lot. I, then I, I came home, I did a lot, I've done a lot of functional medicine stuff and I've worked with a chiropractor and I've worked with a lot of other, um, uh, people, uh, and I think my, my voice now is getting better and better. And I think part of it was the surgery, but also part of it is the therapies that I'm doing now. Well, in 1996, you actually met with Fidel Castro and you went out to Cuba to meet with him there? Yeah, 
I met with them on other occasions as well. Okay. And I guess you guys spent a long time talking, and he said that he thinks the world would have been a better place had your your father and your uncle lived because, like you had mentioned earlier, there was talks about a better situation with Cuba. I mean, the embargo, is it is it even lifted? Didn't Obama no, lift the embar- embargo? Or? Uh, it's it's big. There's, uh, some of it is lifted, but it's still... Um, you Somewhat, know. you can't freely travel to Cuba completely the way you could travel to like Canada or Mexico. I don't know what you can do now. When I went there, you needed a special permission. If you wanted to go legally, you needed to go have a special permission from the U.S. government. And I went legally. A lot of other people would go by going down to the Dominican Mexico, Republic or yeah, Mexico, exactly. and they yeah. can immigrate then. And Cuba would cooperate by not stamping your passport. What was Castro like in person? He was uh, incredibly charming. In fact, I went with Cheryl, and we spent a day with him and my kids, um, you know, I don't know, about two years before he died. And um, he was very, very kind to me and to my family. And, um, you know, he had a very open, engaged mind. And he, I talked to him about a million things. I talked to him about the assassinations. Mm-hmm. I talked to him about... You know, the U.S. attempts to assassinate him. I talked to him about, he was a really big scuba diver. Hmm. And I took my whole family there and spent 10 days. He preserves an area uh, called uh, Gardens of the Queen, south of Cuba. That's one of the biggest preserved ocean areas in the world. And it's probably the best coral reef. It's argument. I I mean, uh, it's it, it's it, probably in the Atlantic, at least, is the best coral reef because it's it's like going going diving in the 1950s, which I did. I started diving when I was six years old, and I've seen you know the deterioration of the reefs all around the world. And um, you go there, and it's like going back to the 1950s because he preserved it. He was very very close to Jacques Cousteau, mm. and um, Jacques Cousteau had talked him into taking this step of uh, preserving it, making it so there's, uh, you know, there, there's no fishing in there. there. There's a very, very limited entry. And, you know, I, we went on, Cheryl and I, and the kids went on a Cuban boat that went out there for 10 days. You sleep on the boat and you dive two or three times a day. And before we went, we spent a day with Castro. And, you know, he told us about all of his diving adventures. Um, he also talked, my kids were very interested in the history of Cuba, and he talked about Batista and uh, talked about, um, you know, my, my kids a- asked him, my son Aiden, he wrote letters to my kids, all my kids afterwards, very lengthy, lengthy letters, and sent us all pictures that one of his sons had taken there. But we asked him, um, my son Aiden asked him, how did you decide, you know, he had come across from, from Mexico on a yacht. It was a big cabin cruiser. I think it was like 52 feet long, called the Grandma, and it was leaky. It was an old kind of, you know, it looked like uh, the, the, the African queen, you know, it was kind of a, smoking a hulk of a, of a ship, and he'd come across from Mexico to get up to the Sierra Maestre, and they had brought 63 men with them. There were a lot of revolutionaries in Cuba at that time, and they were different ilks. Some of them were Marxists, some of them were Democratic. My son asked him, how did you choose which um, which uh, men to bring? Did you just try to bring the ones who were hardcore Marxists? And he said, no, we just brought the smallest one because that's how we fit everybody on and Castro himself is huge you know he's like six foot I don't know three or and very uh you know uh you know he's like he's kind of a formidable guy um so uh anyway I I talked to him about that I talked to him um when I, the first time I went down there I was trying to talk him into stop halting construction on a nuclear power plant mm-hmm and we were showing technology to him about uh, burning the bagasse, which is the waste product of the sugar mills, and how he could, which is just burned openly in Cuba, because they have to get rid of all the cane after they squeeze the sugar out of it. And, and what we showed him is that he could use that. There, there was these new European turbines that have been invented that can, could, could burn the bagasse. 
and generate the same amount, ultimately, of power that he was at that point getting from, was anticipated to get from the nuclear power plant. And he wouldn't have to, it was the same plan that uh, was, the, was, was the Chernobyl design. Oh, okay. We were asking him not to build it. Yeah. And ultimately, he holds it construction. Well, in 1999, John F. Kennedy Jr. dies in a small plane crash. Were you close to him at all? Very close. In Very fact, close. I was waiting for him. I was having, I was supposed to have dinner with him that night. Oh my God, really? Yeah, I was waiting for him at his house in the Cape for him and Carolyn. And it got later and later. And then I, uh, I just started having a bad feeling, you know, that night. And um, it was one of those things when you know, you know, that it's, uh, that it's a bad news. And, um, yeah, we were very, very close. Sorry for your loss. Um, you know, because of that, along with your father and your uncle, people started to coin it the, the Kennedy curse. Does that bother you when you hear that? It doesn't bother me. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't put any stock in it. Uh, I, I, you know, I don't, it's not something that I... I tell people don't talk about the Kennedy curse. I mean, a lot of people in my family have died young. Yeah. Um, you know, my uncle said about my my cousin John. Uh, he said he had every gift except for gray hair. That God gave him every gift but gray hair, and I think that can be said true of a lot of members of my family. Yeah. Well, in two thousand, you endorsed Vice President Al Gore for his presidential campaign. Were you surprised that he didn't win? Um, yes, I was surprised. And I, you know, I wrote an article, actually an award-winning article for Rolling Stone, uh, uh, raising doubts about the uh, legitimacy of that election um, because of the voting, voter suppression and voting fraud that took place in six Ohio counties. Right. I mean, when you compare it to what happened with Donald Trump, do you think that there was election interference or do you think that Trump... You know, I don't, I really don't know. I mean, my suspicion is that there was no, that, that, uh, that the election results are, are legitimate. That's my prejudice. But I, you know, I, I really don't, I wouldn't make that assertion without having really looked into it. And it's not something that I've looked into. What I don't think is right. Uh, I th I don't think it's a threat to democracy for people to say the election was fixed. I mean, we said it in 2001; it was fixed. You know, Bush Gore. And uh, oh, that's, sorry, Bush Gore was 2001. I it was Kerry who you know in 2004 that I won the, um, the you know that I wrote that article about. Right. So I thought the election was fixed in 2004, that it was, you know, we got the wrong result. I think that everybody agrees that 2001 was, you know, was fixed. And so I, you know, from, I don't think, I think the election systems are broken. We need to change the way that we can't rely just on machines. We need paper ballots. Um, and then there's other changes that we ought to make. I mean, we listen, we have a whole city called Las Vegas that was built on, you know, the capacity of machines to count right and not make mistakes, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's ATMs on every corner in every city in this country right. that never give you too much money. <laughs> so we know how to make a, a machine that can count right. And it's our election system. We're supposed right. to be the world's exemplary democracy, Right. So, uh, number one, we should be able to, we should have machines that everybody has faith in that can't be hacked, you know. And I, I don't, you could probably hack a, an ATM. I don't know. But, you know, you don't hear about it a lot. So, somehow those machines are built, you know, I mean, they wouldn't be there if they were easy to hack, right? The, the banks wouldn't keep them there. Uh, we must be able to build a machine that can't be hacked. And we also ought to have the safeguard of having paper ballots at every voting booth. And then, you know, I, I have a, you know, one of the things that I'm going to do as president is I'm going to make passport cards available to every American who needs, a, who can't afford them for free. That will allow us to demand ID at the voting booth, which Democrats don't like you know, laws that require voter ID because 
a lot of their constituents don't have driver's license. You know, blacks in the cities, a lot of particularly young black people do not have driver's license because they don't need them. There's elderly people all over the country who, who, who have expired driver's license, and so they don't get a new one. And there are a lot of students in the country and young people who don't have their licenses. So Democrats don't like laws that say you need a driver's license or you need a, a, a picture ID to get, you know, to, to vote because they think that that's going to disenfranchise their principal constituents. Republicans in turn have anxiety that there's cheating going on, there's voter fraud, and there's an easy way to settle it, to, to solve this for, both, for everybody, which is right now it costs 65 bucks to get a federally issued photo ID, which is a passport card, just the card. It's not the book, it's the card. What I'm going to do is I'm going to waive that fee. That's a barrier to a lot of people. Um, I'm going to waive that fee so that anybody can go to any local post office and with proof of citizenship and get that ID. What does that do? Here's what it does. Number one, it, it gets the, 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 uh, the constituent, the Democratic powerhouses. I mean, Andrew Young's already agreed to this. The civil rights leaders, uh, Al Sharpton and others, have said if, uh, if we do that, they will drop their objections to the to a requirement of photo ID at the voting booth. So you solve all those problems, those anxieties between Republicans, those friction between Democrats and Republicans. Number two, if you don't have a voter ID in this country, you're a second class citizen. You can't get a bank account. You can't open a bank account. Wow, okay. <laughs> you can't that means if you get your social security check, and a lot of Americans are living like this. You get your social security check or your paycheck, you have to go to a check casher. And that guy's taking ten percent. Exactly. Oh, you know, it's already poor, hard to be poor, yeah. and it just everything makes it harder. You can't get on an airplane. You can't get a hotel room. Mm -hmm. You can't. Uh, you can't visit your child at school without mm -hmm. a government issued photo ID. Yeah. So your life is terrible, right? More terrible than than it, than it already is. Than being poor already makes it. The other thing it does is by giving, getting these photo IDs to everybody is it stops the immigration price of the border. Because right now, if you're an employer, let's say you're a construction firm in New York, and you want to hire illegal aliens, it's, Ill it's illegal for you to do that. But all you have to ask for is a social security card, and then you check the box. And that's all the government demands of you. Social Security card has no photo on it. Right. It's easy to fabricate. You're passed from yeah. hand to hand. It's made out of paper, yeah. And then they they give the guy, you know, they're uh, they're paying the guy, you know, seven dollars, eight dollars, twelve bucks an hour on a construction site. That firm, these unscrupulous firms who are knowingly doing this because they know they can get away with it, are now bidding for contracts against union shops. Hmm. So there's, you know, they're screwing everybody. Well, if you just say you can't get a job in this country unless you show a government-issued photo ID, a passport card, and we make sure everybody's got one who's legal, what it means is nobody comes across that border again because yeah. everybody is coming across because they want a job. If they know they cannot get a job in the United States of America without that card, they're going to stop coming, and that solves the problem overnight. I love it. You're a partner with Vantage Point Capital Partners? I was. They, they're, they're now gone. Okay. Well, but at the time, it was one of the world's largest clean tech venture capital firms. And you guys were the largest pre-IPO investor in Tesla? Yes. Okay. I've owned four Teslas. <laughs> it's by far my favorite car. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, thank you. <laughs> Great car. <laughs> I have a Model X Plaid my now, son which just is the best bought, car I've ever owned. My son owned. just bought one. He bought a used one. What do you think of that idea? I bought a used one at one point. You did? It's cool. A new one's I was better worried because you can't get a warranty, and I thought if that battery well, dies. Yeah, well, I had I, I bought it directly from Tesla, which had the extended warranty oh, at the okay. time. But now I have a new one. By far the best cars ever. According to the internet, you have a net worth of $15 million. Is that more or less accurate? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I didn't get any of that Tesla money. No? Why didn't you get the Tesla money? Well... You know, actually, the guy who was running my, who was running Vantage Point um, was uh, 
got in a very bad fight with uh, Elon. He, this guy was a very acerbic uh, Silicon Valley venture capital. He was one of these, you know, uh, sort of alpha male, you know, uh, double X testosterone uh, <laughs> guys who is uh, who got in a bad fight with with um, with Elon. And Elon actually writes a lot of, like, I think I would describe as vitriolic. Uh, a description of his relationship with this guy. They didn't like each other. And Vantage Point bailed out of Tesla very early. And I think they only got, they sold out uh, all of their stake to Mercedes-Benz. And I think they only got maybe four or five X. Whereas if they'd hold on to that stake, they'd have made 5,000 X. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I kick myself for not buying Tesla stock back in 2015 yeah, when I bought my first but, Tesla. But, but, I, own, I own stock now, but I wish I'd bought back then. Yeah, if you but, were pre-IPO, oh, my God. Yeah, but my um, my uh, my deal with Vantage Point would not, well, only apply to companies that I was involved in. So, I, you know, I wouldn't have gotten – I wouldn't have gotten – a. a piece of that Tesla stake anyway. And, you know, so I, I don't know what my net worth is, probably a little more than that, but I don't know. Got it. Okay, so let's lead into why you're here today. In a speech in New Hampshire, you said you were considering running for president. And you said, I'm thinking of, I was thinking about it, I've passed the biggest hurdle, which is my wife <laughs> has greenlit it. Now, originally, well, you wanted to be a candidate for the Democratic nomination. Now, I looked it up. The last time an incumbent president wasn't elected by their party was Franklin Pierce in 1856. That, wait, that was, that was what? That wasn't elected by their party? Yeah. Meaning that, what do you mean? Meaning that an incumbent president that was about to run for a second term, the, the Democratic oh. Party didn't want them to run again. So what I'm saying is that when you have a president that's done a first term, they're almost always you know, nominated by their party to do the second term. So yeah. why did you originally want to run for Democratic president? Well, I mean, first of all, I'm a Democrat. I was born exactly. a Democrat. My family is the iconic, you know, right. family in the Democratic Party. Yeah, which which would have meant that you probably would have ran after Biden's second term if he had a second term. Yeah, but I, I wasn't sitting around looking to run for president. I, okay. You know, I didn't ever intend to run for president. I ran for president because what I saw happening in, in this country, and particularly the Democratic Party, I felt like I was in a unique position to, um, to to save the country from what's happening. I mean, for, you know, the Ukraine war it was one of the issues, the censorship that I saw going on, uh, the government orchestrated censorship of individuals who are criticizing government policy it never happened before in our country and orchestrated by the Democratic Party. And, uh, and then the, um, you know, this corrupt merger of state and corporate power which is strip mining the middle class in this country of its wealth, of its equity, um, destroying black communities. There's going to be no equity in black communities within uh, by 2030, and uh, and just destroying quality of life in in our country in all communities. The Rust Belt, the Farm Belt, you know, our urban areas, and this disintegration. And I felt like I, because I've been on the forefront for so many years of addressing, the, fighting the issue of corporate uh, capture of our regulatory agencies, that I was in a, in a really good position to unravel it, and that, you know, a lot of the uh, history with democratic values uh, put me in a position where I really felt like I had to speak out on it. Well, on October 9th of this year, you announced you're running as, as an independent, mm -hmm. which makes you the fifth member of your family to seek presidency of the United States. Now, as an independent, it's sort of a, you know, different situation. The last person I felt that ran as independent and made some sort of progress was Ross Perot. And Ross Perot, what he essentially did was he split the Republican vote. And like George H.W. Bush blamed him for not getting a second term. You never have seen an independent actually win the presidency. So is your goal to win the presidency or is it to gain a certain amount of power based on your vote and do certain deals that will help some of the causes that you're no, looking to. No, so win the presidency. Okay, so you're trying to win the presidency. Yeah. Okay. How realistic do you think that is? I, I think it's realistic. I mean, I you know, Ross Perot was winning. He was beating um, both Bush 
and um, Clinton and Gore. He had 39% of the Gore. vote. What? It was it Clinton, I think. No, no, Bush and Gore, right? No. Oh, was it Bush and Clinton? Bush and Clinton, yeah. Well, what year was it? Was it, or it was 96? You ran for independence in 92. Yeah, okay, so ni- 92. Yeah. yeah. He was at thir- and, uh, yeah. he and, got and, up to, and 96, I believe. I he got up to 39%. Yeah, a lot. He was beating both of them. Yeah. So he was leading. And then uh, there were threats against his daughter, huh. and he withdrew. And then when he got back in, he never was able to recover. So it's quite possible that if he had stayed in, that he would have won. Hmm. Um, but also today, you know, at that point, I think there was only 20% of Americans were registered independents. Today, more than 50% or I, somewhere around 50% are. Wait, 50% are registered as independent? Are independent. It's, either, it's between 40 and 50%. Okay. So it's the biggest party today. Okay, well, your family spoke about you running. There was a signed statement by four of your siblings. You know, how many how many people I have in my family? A lot. 105. 105. Yeah. So four, four people from your family, a Maryland Lieutenant Governor Kathleen Kennedy Townsend, former Representative Joseph Kennedy II, Rory Kennedy, and Kerry Kennedy. They said the decision of our brother Bobby to run as a third-party candidate against Joe Biden is dangerous to our country. Bobby might share the same name as our father, but he does not share the same values, vision, or judgment. Today's announcement is deeply saddening for us. We denounce his candidacy and believe it to be perilous for our country. When you hear that from your siblings, what do you think? You know what? I'm okay with it. I, you know, I was raised in a family where we we argue with each other. My father encouraged us to argue and debate every night. Um, in fact, you know they they orchestrated debates the same way my grandfather did with them. So, you know, there's a lot of things I disagree with my family on. I, we were on different sides on the, during the Obama. When Obama ran, I was on one side, they were on the other. And there's a lot of issues that I, I don't agree with any of those people on the war. You know, I don't agree with them on censorship. I have five members of my family who are working for the administration. I have... A, President Biden has a bust of my father behind him in the Oval Office. Mm. You know, my family has a long, long relationship with them. And, you know, I'm sure, you know, those four particular people are horrified. And I'm running against somebody who they consider a friend. Mm. Oh, you know, I'm able to love people with, who I, with whom I disagree. And, you know, I, I, so I'm, I'm okay with them doing, you know, whatever they whatever, of expressing themselves. Um, but I don't affect, think it affects my candidacy at all. Well, you've said one of your platforms is that the American government is dominated by corporate power. You said the Environmental Protection Agency was run by the oil industry, the coal industry, and the pesticide industry, and the Food and Drug Administration is overly dominated by big pharma. Uh, big pharma and also, you know, the uh, industrialized food processors, you know, um, and big ag as well. Mm-hmm. What's going to be the first thing you do if you get elected president? The first thing I do? Yes. Like the first day? Yeah, the first day. Uh, the first day I'm going to I'm gonna free Julian Assange. I'm going to free Edward Snowden. I'm going to pardon them. Okay. I'm going to issue an executive order forbidding any federal employee from collaborating with social media media sites to censor political speech in this country. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to issue an order that passport cards are going to be now available at 33,000 post offices around the country for anybody who needs them. I'm going to go down to Bethesda, to NIH headquarters, and I'm going to speak with the employees sometime in that first week and say that, you know, we're now going to focus on chronic disease and we're going to have good science and we're going to open up the databases to the public and we're going to cure chronic disease. We're going to end the chronic disease pandemic in this country. And then, you know, in the first 90 days, I'm going to start the process of winding down the empire abroad and bringing, you know, closing. I'm going to do a base closure commission for 800 bases we've got abroad. I'm going to figure out which ones we can close and how we can cut our military budget from $900 billion a year to $500 billion a year. Um, I can go on. Well, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., I appreciate you coming in and doing this interview. And I'll be honest, a few months ago in an interview when I interviewed Math Hoffa, I said that I wouldn't do an interview with you. 
You interviewed Robert F. Kennedy. Yes, I did. That was one that I wouldn't do. Why? Because of all the conspiracy theory shit. Um, he didn't, if you watched the interview, we I didn't, didn't watch really, the interview. We didn't really, we didn't really dive into any conspiracy. Because that's his thing. Yeah. Uh, COVID is fake and blah, 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 blah. Because of some of your stances about COVID, which I disagree with. But ultimately, when I looked into your story and I saw all the good that you did in terms of your environmental work and everything else like that, I, I realized I need to get off my high horse. Except that <laughs> people will have different opinions than me on certain things. And that doesn't mean that they don't deserve a platform and don't deserve a, a place to speak on Vlad TV. And uh, what you've done over the course of your life has been phenomenal. I think that, uh, you know, the, the amount of companies that you've sued that, it was, that was dumping toxins in our environment and everything else like that is, uh, you know, something they don't speak about enough. You know, when, when they talk about your name, they focus on more of the, you know, the gossip and everything else like that, but they don't talk about all the good work that you did. So, um, you know, congratulations on your journey. And, um, you know, I'm looking forward to see how this race develops. Thank you, Vlad. And let me say something to you. Mm -hmm. You know, on COVID, I would bet that if you and I actually spent time talking about it, that you'd find that you probably agree with me on almost everything that I, um, you know, that I, uh, that I feel about COVID. Um, I think a lot of people who disagree with me about the, how we handled the COVID pandemic are people who were reading mainstream media reports about what I said rather than actually looking at statements that I made. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, that's part of the problem is that a lot of what I've said has been distorted and mischaracterized. Oh, people believe I'm anti-vax and that, you know, um, a lot of other things about me that aren't true. Mm -hmm. So anyway, maybe we can talk about that one day. Absolutely. And find uh, some uh, common ground. Yeah, I mean, we're all gonna have disagreements. No one's gonna sit down with me and have the exact same views that I do. So I respect the views that you have and uh, hopefully likewise. But thank you so much for sharing your views and thank you so much for just telling your story because your family is so legendary and will always be legendary. And, um, you know, it's really an honor to sit down with you and talk the way we did today. Thank you, Vlad. It was an honor to be with you too. Absolutely. Peace.